thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you for this opportunity. Together we can learn some things about God's Word. We're living in a very, very difficult and strange age, challenging age. Some of the challenges are new to us. Some of them may not be. But um, verbal inspiration of the Scriptures... As was read just a moment ago, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That the man of God might be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The question before us tonight is whether we have the complete word of God in the New Testament. And especially are we going to ask and answer the question, are there any missing gospels? The reason I'm going to address that is because very liberal scholarship today uh, passes off that there are missing Gospels and that you really don't have the complete story when you hold in your hand the 66 books of the Bible. You can go to Barnes and Nobles or Books a Million and they have a religious section and you can start noticing some of the books and titles in that section. Might have things that indicate that they're telling you that there are missing gospels. And we want to ask and answer the question whether that is so. And if not, uh, how do you answer that? Is it so that there are missing gospels? Do good to turn this on. Okay. The Bible collection that we have, 66 books, 39 old, 27 new Testament books. How, when, and why do we have that many and not more since others are claiming there were books like the book of Thomas or Judas or some of those uh, that have been discovered in 1947 and 49. A collection of books called the Nag Hammadi Collection Those collection of books are full of some of the many uh, false gospels that were passed along after the 4th century. Uh, Maybe one or two might have caught the 3rd century. But there are none of those that were thought to have been inspired of God even up to the 4th century. And so they weren't included in our Bible simply because they were not considered inspired books. Some of them were considered fraudulent books to start with and therefore were not included. But here's a quotation that uh, might be of interest to, to you in a book by Dan Brown called The Da Vinci Code. There was a movie based on that book not too long ago. On a certain page... He mentions this scholar, Lee Teabing, explains the, uh, to a cryptologist, Sophie Neveu, or Neveau, quote, this is the claim. This claim is based on scholarship, of modern scholarship since 1947, when those uh, books were discovered. And so here's the claim. Because Constantine upgraded Jesus' status almost four centuries after Jesus' death. In other words, the claim here is that Jesus was just a man. Constantine came along about four centuries later and upgraded his status. And started claiming he was the son of God. He was, had divine attributes. He says... Uh, Because Constantine upgraded Jesus' status almost four centuries after Jesus' death, thousands of documents already existed chronicling his life as a mortal man. To rewrite the history books, Constantine knew he would need a bold stroke. Constantine commissioned and financed a new Bible which omitted those Gospels that spoke of Christ's human traits and embellished those Gospels that made him godlike. The earlier Gospels were outlawed, gathered up, and burned. And so there was this 
conspiracy. A conspiracy to make up a Jesus that was godlike after the fact was he was just a man. And the claim is that these earlier gospels proved that he was just a man and that Constantine suppressed those and others then burned them. And so they were so suppressed that we, we've, at the blessing of the Catholic Church, we now hold in our hands four gospels upgrading Jesus to God's status. He was just a man. That's all he was. Now, that's a bold claim. And, of course, it is a life and uh, mind-changing claim as well. It summarizes the view of modern scholarship that says that there are missing Gospels. So I want us to study tonight, and this will take some effort on your part as well as effort on my part to cover this concisely, but also thoroughly. And so that's going to be a hard, hard job. But here's, here we go. Let's first of all start with the collection. How was the collection of biblical writings, what Paul says, are inspired by God. Obviously, all writings were not inspired by God. And so scriptures that were in, given by inspiration of God are special. What helped them to collect and determine the special, sacred, holy, and God-inspired, God-given writings from those that men might have pawned off as forgeries? How is the collection determined? And so here's the first thing that we have to know. We have to know this. Starting on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles... The mission, as Jesus had said in John chapter 16, was to guide them into all the truth. John 16, 13. Now, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, they didn't write it down right then. They spoke it orally. And so the words of the apostles were spoken. Acts 2 verse 42 says... They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They were listening to the oral teaching of the apostles. Not only that, but anytime anybody said something new, they would always have what they had been hearing from the apostles to check it by. Plus, the scriptures of the 39 books of the Old Testament, they had that to check it by. So they had the 39 books of the Old Testament prophetic word plus the apostles' teaching, the memory that the apostles' teaching coincided with and agreed with the Old Testament writings. And so they could always filter it through that, through the oral teachings of the apostles. These were always confirmed with miraculous signs. In Mark 16 verse 20 says the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. And so miraculous signs always demonstrated that God was with the words of the apostles. Anybody that said something the apostles didn't say, they, they couldn't back it up with a miracle and so you could always dismiss what they said. The miraculously confirmed words of the apostles was the authoritative words because it was confirmed by miracles. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first was spoken to us by the Lord and then was confirmed unto us by those who heard him, that would be the apostles, God working with them and confirming it with miraculous signs of the Holy Spirit. So miraculous signs confirmed the oral teaching of the apostles and backed it up and said, Yes, I, I God, approve their words. Miraculous signs demonstrated it. 
And thus it was confirmed by signs and it was confirmed as being in agreement with the prophetic word, thus establishing that these are the words of God. Now somebody comes along, for example in Acts 15, a man comes along and says, you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Well, immediately that ought to throw up a red flag because nobody could remember the apostles ever saying that. And then the apostles then began to discuss it with the elders in Jerusalem and they began to confirm again, what did we say from the beginning? They always went back and said, did you ever hear us say that? Was that ever confirmed through our mouths to your ears? And if it wasn't, they could quickly dismiss it. Colossians chapter 2 is in a case where he says, you're complete in Christ... And if somebody comes along and preaches something else, don't let them defraud you of your reward by demonstrating some false humility and worship of angels, things intruding into things that they do not they do not know and understand. Or in Galatians one, how is it that you are so soon removed from Him who called you into the grace of Christ? to another gospel, which we didn't preach. There's not another gospel. If it didn't come through the apostles, and if it comes through somebody else, even an angel or even the apostles start preaching something different than they originally preached, then that was to be dismissed immediately. So what we understand then is that there was a way of checking The teaching, even in the first century, even though it was in oral form, you could check it by the apostles and those who heard the apostles and those who had their hands of the apostles laid on them so that they could continue to confirm what the apostles said. There were those kinds of checks and balances in place long before the fourth century. Long before the Catholic Church began to emerge and have some kind of political uh, power or um, credibility in the sight of some people. When you forfeited the words of the apostles in favor of something that you cannot know or did not know was true, then what you had was a counterfeit word. And you had to check it always by the apostles' teaching. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want you to notice that Paul thought this was very, very important. So he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, He said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Why? Because there were competitive wisdoms of men, that is, philosophies of men that were being circulated. And so he said that I want to only teach you about Jesus Christ, the truth about Him and Him crucified, And it wasn't about me. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. What was competing with him was human wisdom. But what I gave you was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That is, we backed it up with miraculous power. We didn't just tell you things and say, expect you to believe it. We backed it up with miraculous power. That your faith, the reason we did that, is so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So you could know a counterfeit comes along Number one, he's not teaching the same thing as the apostles. Number two, it doesn't agree with the Old Testament. Second, uh, and third of all, it's not backed up with miraculous power. 
So if I believe what this fellow is saying, then I'm trusting and I'm entrusting my soul to human wisdom and my faith is not in God, but it's now in the wisdom of that man. And Paul said, I never wanted that to be the case with you. So it was confirmed with miracles and the counterfeit words were not confirmed with miraculous signs. Human wisdom was expressed quite often, but it was not backed up by miraculous signs. They could question what was said. Lack of agreement with the confirmed words would throw up a a flag, a mental flag that said, wait a minute now, I'm not sure we can go along with that. Departure from the established words of the apostles was always dangerous and was emphasized in every single book of the New Testament that I know of. There's something that addresses the false idea that's being passed along versus what the apostles had taught. Departure from the prophetic word and the apostles was a red flag deal. So here's what we have. There are two tests that you could apply. One is the external test, the other is the internal test. I've talked about these things before, but I want to remind you of these two tests. External tests were such things as this. You got this book, and it claims to be, for example, the Gospel of Thomas. Or uh, this book claims to be the Gospel according to Judas. And you're scratching your head. And you're asking yourself in the 4th century, could it be that Thomas really wrote that? Could it be that Judas really wrote that? And so here are the tests. Do we know the author? Red flag number one is if you didn't know, you always put it to the back burner and checked it out with other tests, but you didn't accept it immediately. Do we know that it was confirmed so that churches knew this was from the apostles? And if you couldn't answer that in the affirmative, that we know it was confirmed, then you always slid that one to the back then, the back burner, and say, we'll come back to that later. But we're going to group, we're going to deal with what we know is the inspired words of the apostles. Either originally or secondarily by men in churches with miraculous gifts of discernment, could they manage a logical way of determining the apostles' teaching from that which was new and different from the apostles' teaching? Is it commended by faithful men, people that you can trust, that you know they're connected with the apostles? And the apostles recommended them. The apostles did a lot of recommending, didn't they? And they also spoke of men that you ought to be aware of. So was it secondarily even um, credited by someone who knew these to be miraculously confirmed Words of the apostles. Is it commended by faithful men and faithful churches? Or did it come along a little bit too late? Or a lot too late? For the apostles to have said those things. Or to have really said those things. Most of the so-called gospels that people today, modern scholarship are saying are discovered since 1947, and now we've got a collection of them, and these were missing because of that conspiracy to get rid of the truth about Jesus. Well, the truth is, most of those so-called lost gospels were lost after the third and fourth centuries because they never were in the first century, and they never were in the second century. And so how could they have been uh, lost from something that the apostles were telling the whole of? They didn't fail to tell the whole counsel of God or to 
be guided into all the truth by the apostles. So now we have the external test is looking at those external things you can know about it. And then you look at the book itself. You start looking in the book itself and at the pages that are in that book. And you ask these questions. Does it agree with what we know and what has already been established? If it's contradicting what we already know and has already been established, one of the first things that you knew was that the resurrection of Jesus Christ confirmed that Jesus was God. He wasn't just a man. His resurrection was one of the first things that you ever knew about Jesus Christ. So if someone comes along and and only tries to emphasize some human aspect of Jesus, and we're not denying the human aspect of Jesus, we're just saying that's not all he was. Does it agree with what we know and what has already been established? Second of all, does it agree with already confirmed messages of the apostles? And does it agree with the prophetic word of the Old Testament? You see, even the Old Testament said... A son would be given, a child would be born, and he would be called mighty God. The apostles didn't make that up. That was already in the Jewish section of the book. And there were other prophecies like that 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 put deity, an attached deity to this child. And it wasn't just the apostles talked about him just being human And then Constantine started adjusting the apostles' teaching in the 4th century and and passed him off as divine. But actually, you got to to go back and you got to start tinkering with the Old Testament, part 2. And not only that, but all the manuscript copies since the 1st century, you got to keep tinkering with all and find every one of them and change them all. You can't do that. That's impossible. So those two tests, external tests, what do you know about it from the outside? What, do you, what are you seeing on the inside? Is there agreement with the things that you know are true with the apostles' teaching? I've got in my library some of these, and it's a barrage of false claims. There's one that's called the Lost Books of the Bible. Again, this comes out since 1947 and 49 when that Nag Hammadi library was discovered and started being passed along and then scholarship started quote leaning on those pretty heavily they're lost because they're not ever and they've never been inspired to start with they're not hidden but they're called hidden gospels like the catholics had the whole control over everything and And they had this conspiracy to hide the truth about Jesus. No, I'm telling you. If the apostles had the the power, I mean, if the Catholics had the power to manipulate and to change the Word of God, it would be a whole lot different than this. Number one, you'd start reading about popes on every page. There's not a pope in here. There's not cardinals in here. There's not the adoration and veneration of Mary. And there's not statues and images. I mean, there's just lots of things that if the Catholics were in charge of it, they would manipulate it and it would be completely different than this. And they wouldn't have Peter as being a married man because they want him to be the first pope. See, it would be a whole lot different. If it was a collection with a conspiracy to manipulate the truth about Jesus and make him into a God after the first century and get him on up to the fourth century and start making him that way. The hidden gospels were written mostly after the fourth century anyway. And they were hidden from view because people were ashamed that people would try to manipulate the truth about Jesus that way. Not because there was something sinister about those who had some kind of political clout in the 4th century. Then there are those who look at some of those as Gnostic Gospels. 
Gnosticism was growing from the first century onward and get, became very, very popular in the third and fourth centuries. Here's a comparison. This is a very good per- comparison if you want to understand the difference between these Gnostic Gospels like the Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Tana, Thomas, uh, Barnabas, some of those. Compare it to the Book of Mormon that we know was discovered in the 1930s. I mean the 1830s, excuse me. All right, 1830, here comes the Book of Mormon discovered by Joseph Smith. He claims this is something an angel told him, showed him some golden plates, helped him through some stones to interpret it from some kind of strange Egyptian writing and then put it in English. When he puts it in English in 1830, mind you, there are some things about it that are very, very strange for, a, for an 1830 writing. Now, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Keep that in the background. The Da Vinci Code makes these claims. Thousands of works that describe Jesus' life were suppressed. That's the claim. But that's after the 4th century and particularly after 1947 when these collections started being discovered. Constantine picked four Gospels out of 80 valid choices. This is Dan Brown's claim in the Da Vinci Code. All right, so now we've got, we're going to test the Book of Mormon and we're going to test this claim. How are we going to do that? Well, here's, here's where we're going to begin. We're going to first begin with the New Testament collection. First, it was revealed in oral form, as we've said. Backing that point up, I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 2. He says, Brethren, I don't want you to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter. Here's something written. Here's something that is said orally. I don't want you to be troubled by anything that comes along, whether it's said in spirit, maybe by implication, or by word, directly said, or by letter, as if, as if it was from us. Somebody might claim it's from us. I don't want you to be shaken. As though the day of Christ had come. We didn't say the day of Christ had come. That is, his second coming hasn't come yet, and we didn't say it has. So if somebody starts saying that, then throw your red flag up. Remember, we never said that. Then look at verse 15. He says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. That is, traditions are things handed down. Traditions that you were taught were handed down to you, whether by word, that is orally. So you get these traditions orally, or by our epistle. So there's two things that started developing. From the oral teaching of the apostles on the day of Pentecost to the time they started writing them down, you had both forms. You had word, orally, and you had that which was written. So when we look at the first revelation was in oral form, and secondly, it was a growing number of documents that passed the test because we remember what the traditions were that were handed down to us. And then you have Peter saying this in 2 Peter 3, verse 15. He says that the apostle Paul wrote Scripture. The apostle Paul wrote scripture. He says in 1 Peter 3, verse 15 and 16. 
Account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles. So Peter is endorsing the epistles of Paul. And he's saying, and he's comparing them to anything else that was divinely given. He says he was speaking in them of these things. Paul agreed with what I'm saying is what Peter is saying. And I agree with Paul. And I recognize though that there are in Paul's writing some things that are hard to understand. Which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction. As they also do the rest of the scriptures. Now what I'm establishing here is that the early collection was testable in the memory of those who had those traditions passed along to them orally and in writing. Thirdly, the churches passed along these inspired documents. Paul through the Colossians said, when you get this letter, see that you have it read and read the one uh, from Laodicea. Fourthly, Written documents became the only source of approved authoritative information after the apostles died. And the apostles all died, save John, before A.D. 70. Now, that means all of them were completed in the first century. Traditions had to be tested against the commonly approved, written, and considered inspired writings. You always had to check it by that. Memories would die after a while, and the written records would prevail to back up what was true to memory. And so then then we have the written documents that we have now. Now, (coughs) excuse me. Let's consider some of these other things. I want to demonstrate that before the 4th century, before the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., that there were only four Gospels that were standard long before Constantine came along. In other words, we can demonstrate that all along from the 1st century to the 4th century, Those who had studied and heard from the apostles and passed along their knowledge all the way on, it had already been recognized that the four Gospels that we possess right now, that those were established. And they were the only credible Gospels in those four centuries. Gnostic writings came later. And even then, what's interesting is that they showed a dependence. That is, the Gnostic writings of the 4th century show that they already know something about these four Gospels. And, interesting enough, they show that they're trying to mimic in some way Something they already recognize as credible. They show a dependence on the already accepted standard. What was standardized in the minds of the early disciples is that there are four gospels that come to us by divine inspiration. The word canon means measured. We've measured it against other teaching. These are the ones that we can say is divinely given. So it is, here's the rule. If you have a ruler, use the ruler to measure something. You measure how tall this is from the the pulpit because you've got a standard rule. Well, if you've established a standard by which you have, have come to understand original inspired writings, that's the canon or the rule or the measure by which you compare anything else. What we find is 
that the Gnostic writings were not taken out of the already established canon or rule that was approved, but that people were trying to add those on to the canon, and and people said, no, those are not inspired. So they don't get to be part of the canon or the rule or measure of divinely inspired documents. They simply left them out to die because they were spurious and sometimes just outright forgeries, unable to be included as part of the canon or measure of inspired documents. If you can't measure it and say that's definitely an inspired document that comes to us from the first century, then you throw it out. If it didn't come from the first century, it's automatically thrown out. But if it didn't come from the apostles and and it doesn't measure up to their apostles, to the apostles' rule or standard, then it's thrown out. And so they are missing... Because they should be missing. Not because they deserve to be there and somebody with some kind of conspiracy said we don't want the truth to come out. What they said was we don't want error to be brought in. So now we're going back to our Mormon application here. Here's the easy test. The external test on the Book of Mormon is red flag number one. It was missing for 1,800 years. Doesn't that tell you something? That tells you if it's missing for 1,800 years, why is it missing for 1,800 years? It's because the apostles never taught it. Didn't teach the Book of Mormon. Didn't need the Book of Mormon. And so red flag number one, external test, when did it come about? 1830. Missing for over 1,800 years. Red flag number two. Not mentioned by the accepted writings. No mention of it. If there were inspired writings like Peter mentions Paul, they should have been mentioned. But there was no mention of them. Then you go to the internal test. And you ask, why is a man, why is a book in 1830 using the same style of English of 1611? Quoting large sections of 1611 King James Version style of English. Now if you understand this, it is a plagiarism is taking something and acting like you revealed it. But when you're quoting large sections of 1611 King James style English, that ought to tell you something that 200 years later... People in 200 years later than 1611 are not speaking English in the same way. And it's interesting then that the internal evidence makes you throw up a flag and say that's, that's, that's a little bit uh, questionable. Plus, the Book of Mormon was written because people in the 1830s were curious about where did the American Indians come from. And so people began to theorize how the American Indians got here. A book by Solomon Spalding began to popularize some ideas about that. And Joseph Smith jumped on that and he borrowed a lot from that. And then on top of that, You've got the contradictions to the Bible. What's been established already. It contradicts it. Well, if it contradicts it, did the same God give it? And the answer, of course, should be obvious. And it contradicts known history. There's a lot in the Book of Mormon that simply contradicts known history. Now, you use that test that you used to the Book of Mormon. Back it up to the 4th century now. Let's back it up to the 4th century and ask ask the same kind of questions. And when you do that, you apply the same test to the Gnostic Gospels. The external test, red flag number one. The apostles didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it in the 1st century. Red flag number two is not mentioned in any of those accepted writings of the 1st century. Red flag number three is in the internal test. It shows that they are depending on those established scriptures 
to try to mimic and look like them, and it contradicts them at the same time. And therefore, we throw them out because not only were they not there in the first century, they don't even agree with what the apostles taught in the first century. And so those are basic tests that you use in any claimed writing. So now, let's see about how those early four Gospels came to be known. Dan Brown says there were 80 equally accepted Gospels by the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. And we say this, if he is wrong on that point, his credibility about these 80 missing Gospels is gone. I mean, he's blown it. So let's back up before Constantine. So we're going to go to Irenaeus of the second century. I want you to notice in the second century that Irenaeus was a writer, prolific writer, who wrote about spiritual matters, and he quotes scripture a lot. But one thing that he said in the second century is that the gospels, uh, uh, he talks about uh, Marcion who mutilates the gospel which is according to Luke. He mutilates it, removing all that is written respecting the generation of the Lord, setting aside a great deal of the teaching of the Lord. I want you to notice the underlying section there. Those apostles who have handed down the gospel to us. He persuaded his disciples that he himself was more worthy of credit than those apostles who have handed down the gospel to us. Now he has some more to say. But here's something else he says. He says, some passages also which occur in the gospels receive from them a coloring of the same kind. He's talking about what Marcion uh, a heretic of the second century was doing. And he says uh, that he twists the statement about his mother when he, when he, Jesus, was 12 years of old. When Jesus says, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And he says, Thus they say, He announced to them the father of whom they were ignorant. Jesus said, I've got to be about my father's business. And he wasn't talking about Joseph there. And then he goes on to point out some other things about what Marcion did in deleting some important passages like that. And so that's why those guys were not believed or believable. Irenaeus wrote about this. And I want you to drop down to this last line right here. From this it is clear that the word, the artificer of all things, being manifested to men, gave us the gospel fourfold in form, but held together by one spirit. Second century, four gospels, not 80 gospels. Not only that, but Origen agrees with that. Irenaeus also says, they produce, let's go to this last line, they produce a fictitious history of this kind, which they style the Gospel of Judas, recognizing that the Gospel of Judas was in play in the second century, but was not considered inspired in the second century. Origen says this, Drop down to this line. The church possesses four gospels. He's third century. Four, uh, four gospels. Heresy, a great many. But the church possesses four gospels. The gospel according to the twelve apostles. You see, over and over, all of the evidence indicates that the evidence is in favor of four Gospels, not 80. Furthermore, Tertullian is a third century writer. He himself 
mentions the four Gospels are the instrumentum evangelium, which he means is the instrument by which we evangelize. The four Gospels are that way. Not only that, but Athanasius of Alexandria. Again, this time look here. The four Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he goes on to list all the epistles. And then he says, and yet, and lastly, Revelation of John. And, and this is in the fourth, the third century. Getting close to the fourth century, but before the Council of Nicaea. So what we have then is one right after the other recognizes that there were four Gospels. Here's one by Eusebius. And I want you to see, in the first place, we must put the Holy Quaternion of the Gospels. That's four, which are followed by the book of Acts. Over and over. Tatian. Tatian is interesting in that he wrote... You know what we just did in the quarters before this one? We studied the four Gospels and we did a harmony of the Gospels. Well, that's what Tatian did, but you know when he did it? He did it in the second century. So the Dia Tesseron is what that was called. And it was weaving the four canonical Gospels together. Why? Because that was the established canon or rule, and that's why he developed a harmony of the four Gospels. So we come to our final question, and that is, why do we only have four Gospels? Why not 80? Because the canon read or rule or standard defined the faith orally to start with, with miraculous power to confirm it, and then with the writings of the apostles to to establish it, And thus we find that there was only room for four and not other Gospels. By AD 180, the four Gospels had clearly established themselves as the key witness to Jesus. As as several ancient witnesses make clear, all these witnesses date to the late 2nd century, early 3rd century. None before or all before Nicaea. And not only that, Irenaeus has told us that there are four Gospels, fourfold Gospel. Tatian had written the Diatessaron and the Muratorian Canon. Only four Gospels are listed there. And Origen lists them in, in, in the order that we have them. The earliest disciples all believed the Bible like we see presently. So in summary, let me conclude. And I appreciate your patience with this. What have we gathered from all of this, we, do, we gather this. You didn't have a date that the Bible just altogether dropped out of the sky. That's not the way it was written. It was written by holy men moved along by the Holy Spirit. And they were written over a process of time. It developed over time through divinely inspired men with miraculous confirmation. Slowly replacing oral traditions with written uh, words. Collected over time with careful tests to separate the inspired from the uninspired writings, the four gospel accounts pass the internal test and the external tests, and everyone can say, these are inspired of God, but not these. You see, those tests were used even in the first century, and they are to be used onward and outward as we keep proceeding. The writings of the apostles were established very, very early. And neither Constantine nor the Council of Nicaea had anything to do. All the Council of Nicaea did was just say what was already recognized. They just said, we, we can't go with any other. Now, they, they may have come out of some kind of an apostasy too, but they weren't, weren't Gnostics. And they also said, but... These are the inspired scriptures. We just recognize what's already been known. All the way. They, didn't, they didn't invent the canon of scripture. They simply recognized the canon that was started on the day of Pentecost and was established all the way along uh, by the apostles' teaching. Thus, we conclude Dan Brown, 
And his quotation of a Lee Teabing, which is a fictitious character anyway, just to make his point, does not tell the truth. There are no secret gospels. You can read them if you'd like to. I have copies of them. Some of them are ridiculous. Uh, many of them are, are trying to, to look like the apostles and then bring in just a little bit of error. But they're just not, they're just not anything like the apostles' doctrine and what the apostles presented. And so do not be deceived, my brethren, by those who would try to deceive you. If you're here tonight, you've never obeyed the gospel. I'm talking about the gospel that the apostles preached. Same one Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. If you've not obeyed that gospel like they did, then here's your chance. Not only now, but if you live longer, you might have other chances. But here's your chance now to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you repent of sins, confess your faith in Jesus, and be baptized for the remission of sins, come now.